Speaking of IPOs, our next guest started and ran a company that has decided to stay private. Yancey Strickler is the co-founder and former CEO of crowdsourcing pioneer Kickstarter. He's also the author of a new book. It's out today. It's called This Could Be Our Future, A Manifesto for a More Generous World. Yancey, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, before we dive into the book, I want to get a little bit of the backstory for yeah. people who may not be as familiar with it. You are somebody who has kind of preached this and lived this for years yeah. about not maximizing profit, not taking every dime that you could possibly get. Yeah. Explain that ethos. Explain why you believe that. Well, Kickstarter, the company I co-founded, we became a public benefit corporation in 2015, which requires us to legally balance producing a benefit for shareholders with also producing a positive benefit for society. And that just came very naturally to us. And also, it's part of like why people love Kickstarter. I and mean, this is a platform that appeals to creative people, to artists. They want to know that they're using a platform that's not using them to cash in and like exit you know, the, the scene or something like that. So we've always had a strong belief that the long-term success of the company relies in a, a strong, you know, a strong tie to our community, a strong tie to these larger values. And I think that's something that's needed elsewhere and is, and is already happening elsewhere. Kickstarter, just for those who aren't even familiar with that, you find a way to get some seed money for yeah. artists or people who are looking to do a creative project, something yeah, like that. Yeah, Kickstarter, someone posts an idea, something they want to make, the public puts up the money to fund it. There's no financial upside. You're just getting a copy of whatever is getting made. But, you know, successful Kickstarter projects include Peloton, which just went public a couple weeks ago, Oculus Rift, hundreds of restaurants, things so like that. So we had this conversation actually multiple yeah. years ago. Yeah. How I, how, because I don't know if you remember this, to me, I always say Kickstarter felt like a, a, one of the greatest philanthropic ideas around. Yeah. But I never thought of it as a true investment because if I had put money up for a Peloton, I might have gotten a bike out of it. Right. 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 But I'm not getting what uh, John Foley and all of the other investors right. are getting. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, when Peloton's putting its project on Kickstarter, it raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. But it was an early idea. It was like a, quite a speculative thing. And so it wasn't maybe a great business case at that moment. It was right. just more, here's a couple entrepreneurs. We have this vision. We think that there's public interest. Can we capitalize on it? And so we're a way, you know, Kickstarter is a way that people can interact directly with the public and build that community. But, yeah, there's no financial upside. The upside is more communal upside. It's look at this restaurant. My name's on the door. I, story on the union situation. On the uh, Kickstarter you, union yeah, situation? Clear up that it, it looks like a talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Why, why push back on unionization? Yeah, I'm not, I haven't been involved in the company in the last two years. Right, but what um, do you think's going on? Because it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't look good. It's, does it? It, yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it looks totally hypocritical. Yeah, I mean, what I would hope would happen is there would be a vote. You know, I, I think the why employees think should vote. Back the current man, why do you think current management? Well, they've just been saying that they want the employees to have a vote, like to vote, and if the employees want to have a union, it will happen, and if not, it wouldn't happen. And I think, I think the idea is just to put it to the employees to make that decision. But I'm not clear on why that hasn't happened or what it takes yeah. for that to happen. But as a co-founder, you know, owner of the company, I'd, I'd love for them to vote today and just move on one way or the other. Do you, do you, is there anything to, if, if I were to push back in, and I, I, I look at some of the things in your book, that a lot of the ills of society you, you tie to the, the profit incentive. And I, it's, I don't know how you look at it in a vacuum. I mean, we've tried other things, and it may not be perfect, but it's the yeah. best society has ever figured out, the yeah. profit incentive. Yeah. And it just seems like... If, if a company uh, is profitable, employees keep their jobs, uh, the employees keep paying taxes to fund education and all the social needs we need. If someone becomes wealthy by being an entrepreneur, he becomes a philanthropist. It, it just seems like the converse, I don't think you put forward that, wow, it's really better if you don't make any money. And if, if the company is unsuccessful and actually loses money, you're really doing well because it just, that seems like the converse of what you're saying. I guess it's not. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree at all with what you're saying. And I feel like the focus on growing the capital base has made sense to this point in history. But I feel like we might be coming to a point where it's time to change streams. Less, and, but, and, and actually try to make less profits and be, be less profitable? Try, or, or, I think it's or, try to grow value in, in multiple ways and not just one. But it's doesn't, just isn't, isn't profit the engine to be able to do all these things that you want to do for society, either through taxes or philanthropy? Possibly, but I think that there are, I think that there are limits to these things. And, and, you know, taxes is interesting because the tax rates keep going down, so the ability for the, you know, the taxes to be used to redistribute some of that income is not really happening to the degree it happened before. We want to redistribute opportunity. Do we want to just purely redistribute income? 
Uh, no, I think opportunity is the ideal. Oh, okay. I mean, I think an, an, an equal opportunity society is what we should work towards. But what I imagine is that financial value is the first rational value we've learned to define, we've learned to trade, we've learned to like, it's all on the same dashboards, but right. I don't think that's the last one. And to me, the next evolutionary step for society is figuring out what are those next values. So something like the climate crisis, I think, puts that right at, right at the forefront crisis. of our mind, crisis. right? Because nice the fact that if we're trying to change that, to change the amount right. of carbon in the atmosphere, we all need to be working carbon on dioxide. similar language. Right. Yeah. Um, have you, is there an, a historical precedent for making this model yeah. and that you can point to where it's been more successful than what we do now. Yeah, I would say, I would say Panasonic. I mean, Panasonic No, no, I mean is... a country, a place where we've become less, you know, and less capitalistic, more socialistic. Is, yeah. if, is, if it, has it been done right anywhere in the past where you've had a, a good outcome? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think if you look where? at something like Europe, where you have a capitalist society that's also balanced with a strong social safety net, you have a mix of saying like, we're not asking for money to be the solution to everything because the conversion fees on that are high, but you're providing other services in other ways. I mean, I think that's a smart way to think about things. I don't know. We, we can choose, uh, and, and it is a, an alternative, but in the last 40 years, I mean, the, the people are fo probably 40, 50 percent less wealthy in Europe than here because of GDP growing at 40 percent less. I think, I think we saw an interesting conflict a few weeks ago with the MBA in China, right, where the idea that economic expansion would be just the would cure all ills, and then we ran into this clash of, well, what happens when economic value runs into, like, values of free speech? And it was, a, it was like a record scratch moment, because we hadn't thought <laughs> well, about it, that it, in a it, while. It was, a, but it, all the people that are supposedly woke were the most unwoke about what really was important, well, think, right? Are you, are you saying well, that they should have taken a, a stronger stand for human rights in China? I'm glad that Daryl Morey tweeted what he did. You are then? Yeah, okay. Yeah, of course. But okay, I think, but, but, I think but that previously we thought that this is the most woke league, the most tolerant league, the, you know, Adam Silver is doing... I think, but I just think here we're running so into like a, a, a new kind right, of... Right, once it ran counter to what you're trying to, to push back on, then, then really the rubber met the road and we saw what they're really interested in. And that... that yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a new kind of friction. It's like the first moment we're feeling that. You know, the, those first pangs, I don't think you get the full response. You're just sort of figuring out this so normal... What what would the response be in, in your in, world? In my you world? You were writing the book for what the NBA was supposed to do. Well, I think that the NBA would probably probably do what Adam, Adam Silver ended up saying, which is like, we can't police this. We're a league that operates according to free speech. You kind of have to take it or lose it, take it or leave it. And then China makes that call, which I think is the line they're trying to hold while, while not pissing anyone off. Uh, but, if I think about, Tough one. but if I think about the need for, say, uh, American companies to say, promote American values in China. Let's say that becomes a new concern, just as right. it was in the Cold War, where American companies were promoting freedom and the idea that you, know, you wouldn't do certain things in markets because that wasn't in the American interest. I think that we're going to have that idea come back again. Because to me, if I look at the 1950s and 60s, the golden age of capitalism, what was happening then is that capitalism was competing with communism. It was forced to prove its merits, like the scoreboard was which system can produce the biggest middle class, can help the most people get to a place of financial sustainability. And it was incredibly performative in those moments. And now there is no real competition for capitalism. We've been in this period of peacetime. What do you make of the argument by our Treasury Secretary, Steve Schwartzman, others who've looked at, for example, what the Business Roundtable yeah. has announced and said, you know what, I wouldn't sign that. Yeah. And the reason they, they often argue they wouldn't sign it isn't because they think, don't think that businesses Aren't, aren't already doing these things, which they would argue they are. Yeah. And, you, and you could dispute that if you want. But they would say, look, it's too hard to serve so many masters. Yeah. If, you give me, if you give me one target, I can, I, can, I can do that. And I probably have to do all these other things to get there. Yeah. But if you give me five, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how to value or judge what I'm doing. Yeah. I, I, I think that's probably true. I think maybe five is too much. It might be two or three. It might be there's... 10 that we're collectively working towards, but it's not everybody's job to work on every single thing. So I feel like the, the notion of an expansion of responsibility for businesses, I mean, it's, it's already happening. Customers are demanding it. Employees are demanding it. Smart companies know that that's how you lead in a market, is by being the first to sort of stake out that ground. Uh, and I, I think it's just going to keep happening. Yancy, you, you've walked the walk for a long time with this. Uh, back in 2015 when you walked away, or when you said that the, the company would not go public, would yeah. never go public, people were looking at a 520-plus 
a million dollar valuation, a billion dollar valuation on, on, on the company. But walking away from that and, and now watching what's happening at Kickstarter, is there a time that company will ever go public, you think? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine. I mean, I, you know, the mindset about not going public, all those things, it's just like we, we really want the service to be what it needs to be for that community. So it, it's just trying to think about those lines, what best serves this product, this platform existing for the long term. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that's, you know, that's the best way to do that. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's less dogmatic than it is just serving the mission is what matters. Like a, a place like Kickstarter is important, a place where someone like the Peloton founders can put an idea and just have a shot. You know, it's so wide open and that, that space needs to be preserved. So that, that's the responsibility.